Today's episode is with thanks to Squarespace.com. Hello cave dwellers, welcome into the cave. This is the Commodore Amiga CD32, a console from 1993, which you have seen on the channel before, and it's still working, I'm glad to say, since that Trash to Treasure uh, series that we made on it. But more importantly and more interestingly, this is the CD32 FMV or full motion video module. Mark, I think it's pretty obvious what it does, but yep. can you just confirm for us? <laughs> um, yes. It offers hardware full screen decoding of video. So it's an MPEG decoder chip in a tin can. And the idea being you could take advantage of this, what was promoted as the world's first 32-bit CD-based console. Um, it's out for debate whether that's true or not. Mm. Uh, it would allow you to incorporate those videos into your games. There is a slight problem. A, this doesn't work. Oh. It was very kindly sent in by Scott. Thank you, Scott. And um, your first impression when you took the lid off, Mark, in a few words? Uh, it looks like somebody sat on it and then had a go at it with a hammer. So we're going to take that challenge on in a minute to see if we can get it working. Uh, and the other problem is there's actually only one game, or to my knowledge, there's only one game that supports this, and that is Cannon Fodder, which gives you an FMV intro sequence and then just the regular game anyway. So oh, um, okay. the benefits are debatable. However, if you move away from games and go into the video CD world, which um, it was quite a popular format in Asia, not so much over here. I had a VCD add-on a little bit later, which went into the back of the uh, PlayStation, the first PlayStation. Mm. Yeah, it was certainly popular in some regions. I remember specifically when we moved into the DVD era and you had DVD players that could also play video CDs, people coming back from holidays from the Far East with right. suitcases full of video CDs. Yes. This was a little earlier than I saw that because we didn't have DVD players in 93, 94. However, it was an option for a lot of people, so it does enhance the, the prospects of this, what we might use it for, watching videos. Whether you agree with me or not, I think it's worth repairing just as a little bit of history for this um, failed console, and we're gonna try our very best to get it going and demonstrate it today. Sounds good. I mean, even if it's nasty, it's all about the preservation. Exactly that. You get the soldering iron, Yep. I'll get the hammer, and let's see if we can make this work. Chop, chop. Here it is then, this is the FMV unit which came out in 1994 at a whopping £199. That's nearly the price of the console itself and it offered MPEG-1 decoding. We're advised not to even test this by the previous owner, such is the horror that lurks inside. There's no screws present, so it's a case of gently levering the case open. Looking around at other images of this unit, I've not seen any screws present, so either everybody's opening theirs, or Commodore have been cost-cutting in its production. And as it opens up, you can see that the board is mounted to the top of the metal housing, and I can immediately see what looks like a huge amount of flux there, Mark. Yep, someone's really fluxed this board good and proper. And also, look at these bent legs. Hmm. Clearly, someone's had a go at replacing this. This is a C-Cube branded MPEG decoder chip, and it looks like they've tried to fit it with a sledgehammer and a pair of welder's gloves. <laughs> it really does. And judging by the damage that we can see, I'm worried that there might be more damage to come hiding under there. But let's get the chip off and we'll see what we're dealing with. I genuinely can't believe how much flux is on this, look at it. The heat gun set to 330 degrees centigrade and the chip, well it lifts okay but I can feel a bit of resistance from underneath which is unusual at this temperature. It's like a toffee factory under there. Do we even have enough towels to mop all of this up? We might actually need a genuine mop to deal with this. <laughs> and there's more problems in the toffee I'm afraid. Some of these tracks are lifted. I suspect that they were lifted before we started and um, might be a hangover from the previous repair because if you look closely you can see evidence that some have been flattened down in an odd shape and that can't have happened by us just removing the chip. Yeah I can see that and that end one there is completely detached. Yeah luckily we don't need that one but it doesn't make the whole thing less concerning. Cleaning this stuff up is impossible without any chemical assistance. You could stand a cotton bud up in there there's so much flux. Oh, Neil, start the timer. We can go for a world record here. I think we can. The, the longest self-standing cotton bud in flux. Valerie, grab the tape measure. Isopropyl alcohol will give us a fighting chance in dissolving the flux and allow us to clean up the board a bit. There's quite a bit of damage around here and one of the traces is almost completely severed from the pad. 
Now these two pads here are completely absent. Luckily for us though, once again the schematics show that they're not actually connected to anything electrically. Half of the pad in the middle has gone here and a few others are bedraggled as well. We can try using these and then patch any that fail a continuity test. I hate to break it to you Mark, but our replacement MPEG chip has turned up and it's got mangled legs also. Okay, it's not a problem. Give me some tweezers and I can sort that out. That's a nice save there, Mark. Don't worry, Neil, I'm an expert. And that looks to be straightened out now. Okay, okay, Mr. Expert. But I'm still worried about those pads and this one here in particular. Yeah, me too, to be honest, but let's just see how we get on. Incredibly, even after cleaning, there's still enough flux on the board to reattach the leads of the replacement chip. Although disaster struck on that pad that you highlighted, you were quite right after all. So I attached some thin magnet wire to the leg and having scraped some of the solder mask away from the track, I soldered the other end of the magnet wire to the board, bypassing the problem. We hope, we hope. Good work though, especially considering the fine pitch of this chip package. I've checked it out with a multimeter and continuity is good on that repair. The new MPEG chip is installed and all the legs have tested out okay. So cross everything, we're gonna fire it up and we're gonna test this thing. And before we get to that, if you need a website, then why not try Squarespace? Squarespace make it easy to create an online presence with their library of templates to get you started, all of which can be customized to the extreme to suit the image of you and your business. Or maybe it's for a personal website, sharing your collection of big box games perhaps. You can make a shop, a blog, a gallery of retro machines, whatever you want to create for your audience. You can do it for 14 days free when you visit squarespace.com forward slash RMC. And if you make a purchase, you can enjoy 10% off using the code RMC. Thank you Squarespace for supporting the cave. And incredibly, it actually works. Well, nearly. We were excited to see it live, but everything's got this reddish hue all over it. Both video and games once you're in them. Back to the table for another look, Mark. Yeah, um, at this point my suspicion was now the DAC chip or digital to analog converter, which is here, and I tried to reflow it. What happened was an incredible amount of flux and blobs of solder came out from underneath the chip. And in doing so, reflowing with no added solder, this bridge happened. Maybe the previous owner used solder paste as liberally as flux on this board. Let's get the chip off and at least clean up what's under there. And it came off easily, a bit too easily for my liking really. <laughs> more flux, more flux Mark, wow. Look, an entire pad is just, it's, well it's just not even there. Maybe it came off on the chip leg, we'll get it under the microscope and nope, there's no sign of it there so I don't know where that's gone, if it was even here when it arrived with us. Let's try and clean that up then, another round of alcohol please Mark. And another missing pad. Again, this one's not connected to anything, but this pad was. So Mark once again attaches some magnet wire to an exposed portion of the track to repair that connection. I then roughly cut it down and put it back out of the way whilst we resolder the DAC chip back into position. Now I was looking at the specs for this DAC chip and it looks like the pin there is responsible for some of the data in the red component of the video signal. Coincidence? Maybe. Could it help us? I don't know enough about it but it's certainly a good pointer and it'd be nice but the mess under the chip can't have helped though. No, not at all. Continuity checked out great though between the corresponding pins after our repair. So I quickly soldered the rest of the pins into place and checked for a good solid connection with the microscope. It all looks good, so let's put it to the test once again with cannon fodder. And frustratingly, despite our findings, the video signal remains pink. How annoying. 
really is annoying, but I don't think we should give up on this. We've come this far. Just to demonstrate the problem a little bit more, take a look at this. This is our CD32 without the FMV module installed and the splash screen when you turn the console on. Everything looks good, but when you put the FMV module in, everything changes. From the moment we switch it on, the splash screen is lacking in red. There is some red, but it's very desaturated. Cannon fodder correctly detects the module and plays its special FMV intro video as we've seen, but it has a red hue. And that carries through into the game. Here's cannon fodder with the FMV module in, and here it is without the module in and the correct colours. Most noticeable are the browns in the tree trunks which vanish with the module installed. Let's just cut back again so you can see that, there we are, and we're missing lots of detail now. It's like there's something going on with the green and the red to affect the brown. And for those wondering what happens when you boot cannon fodder without the FMV module, you get the same intro sequence as the regular version of the game, which has static images from the FMV movie, exactly what we had on the floppy disk version back in the day. Well, not all repairs on this channel are a complete success first time, and no. uh, we've just proven the point there, but I think it makes for an interesting challenge. We've certainly made some progress. Yep. Done a great job on, um, well, unbending it for a start. It was an absolute mess when you opened that up. It was mashed. I'm not quite sure how that happened because uh, someone's obviously had a, a go at repairing it in the past. We've got those two chips, which are completely covered in about an inch of um, flux paste. Um, but yeah, we've replaced the MPEG chip and whilst it's working, it's a little bit pink. Yeah, we've got that pink sheen over the top of it. It was really exciting, I have to say, to see it work for the first time. Yes. Uh, I don't think I ever even saw this demonstrated in a shop back in the day. So that was truly my first experience of seeing this in action. Um, I would compare it up there with the, there's a CDI just next to us out of shot. Um, that also had the option of an FMV module and was very much its competition back in the day, wasn't it? Yeah and it does bring it level pegging when it comes to the video standard, I think. So it does its job well, it's just very pink. Yeah. And have you got any theories on how we can get this working? Well, I've had a look at the schematics. Um, I'm not entirely sure why, but I think it might be something to do with some of the decoupling capacitors, F474 ceramics, which we don't have any of. Between us, we have none. So rather than hang on, we thought we'd throw the question open to you guys. So. Do you subscribe to Mark's theory? Um, or do you have any better ideas? Have the very few FMV module owners out there come across this problem before? We'd love to hear all of your thoughts on what this could possibly be. And we will be back very soon, as soon as those caps have arrived to test out your theory. Yep. And we'll test out anything that you suggest there. And hopefully, hopefully we can follow this up with it working perfectly. Yes. If you've got any suggestions for games that aren't cannon fodder that we could try out, then great, otherwise we'll get hold of some video CDs to test it with. Maybe there's some homebrew or something. Maybe, yeah, I'd like to see that. And um, I'm looking forward to getting this working, available to people to use in the exhibition here, and uh, having my complete CD32 with all of the add-ons. I would have been so proud of this back in the day, at least until the PlayStation came out. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Thanks everyone for watching, take care, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.